All right, cool. Well, um, welcome everyone. Um, we're really excited to have you. Um, I know this is one of the, the final sessions of the evening of the day. Um, whether you're joining for the first time um, or you've been around the whole day, um, I hope you've been having a, a really fruitful and enriching time. I know I have, and it's kind of also one of those things where I know I'm going to have to like sit, sit down with a lot of this stuff for the next like week or two uh, and really reflect on it, journal on it. So um, I, whatever practice that works for you, I, you know, I encourage you to do that with whatever has kind of been running through your head. Um, but uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Rafiq Wabi. My pronouns are he, him. And um, I'm currently a PhD student in community health sciences and in public health. Um, and um, I, I like to think um, a, a lot about um, kind of the, the way that public health um, has the potential to be a tool for social change, but how it's kind of currently used um, as an extension of the medical empire and uh, public health really using a lot of the language of things that, you know, those of us who do, uh, you know, care work or mutual aid work uh, have really founded our, our work on. And so kind of been interested in just how do we uncover these things about public health, whether it's the, the cool ways that people have resisted uh, those, uh, you know, uh, very violent forms of public health and have created their own forms of care. Um, and so just really interested in, in learning and studying that specifically within the context of, of drugs and uh, mental health disabilities and for those who are criminalized and incarcerated. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited today, though, just to have a, a discussion uh, with these three lovely folks. And, um, you know, for those of us, for those of you who are joining, whether it's on the YouTube or if you're, um, you know, have other ways, if you want to, you know, throw in a question, uh, please, you know, send it our way and we'll try our best to, to integrate it at some point during the conversation. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to kind of get ready just to introduce um, everyone here and, and kind of move the conversation over to them. Uh, but uh, the, the title of this session is called Academic Activist, Always the Pragmatist. And uh, mm -hmm. I really, really like the title. Uh, Joseph created it. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's something that um, I think a lot about. And I think everyone on this panel thinks a lot about. Um, and um, I think it's an important question because for me, um, you know, one way you could deal with it is you could just be like, yeah, they're not compatible. If you're an activist, you can just be like, academia sucks, academics suck, tend to often do suck, but you can kind of just stop there and just that's the end of your like, you know, analysis. Um, and I think I've tried that for a bit um, as an academic, but that, that hasn't been super helpful. So I've kind of dug for more. I'm like, I want more. Like, what what can we do? There's there's clear examples of how activism and organizing and the academy have like worked together to create real structural change. Um, so I think if you do enter a space and say, okay, let's try to make that work, whether we're trying to do both, whether we're working between, across, all, all that encompasses that, I think it's a very important question then to start to talk about what are the realities and what are the limitations of doing um, work within the academy, around the academy, or even if you're an activist organizing with the academy, right? What are the limitations of those things? But, but also, how do we see those limitations as just a current structure and a current way and a current formation of doing things and think beyond that? How do we have centers of education that are much more embedded in, in the community and all those things? So that's kind of the start of this. And what we're going to get a chance to do in the next hour or so is really just hear from three folks and their different perspectives from their different backgrounds and how they've approached this and thought about this or have decided that it's not a worthwhile project to invest in. So whatever whatever the conclusions are, I'm just kind of excited to, to listen and engage. And um, so I'm going to do some brief introductions really quickly. And then um, also just to give you a heads up, you'll have a chance to kind of share a little bit more about yourself too. So this is um, just very quickly. Um, so first we have um, Juan R. Pantoja Pantino, and he is a doctoral level psychologist trainee in counseling psychology at Loyola University, Chicago, in Chicago, Illinois. Um, however, he currently serves students at the University of Notre Dame Counseling Center. He firmly believes that mental health concerns are rooted in toxic social conditions, for example, oppression, environments, injustices. And solutions need to go beyond individual interventions, such as liberation and critical psychologies. Next, we have Shannon Pagdon. And Shannon is a research coordinator and nationally certified peer specialist living with psychosis. Shannon has worked as a research assistant with the EpiNet project and with the University of Pittsburgh. 
Shannon is the co-creator of Psychosis Outside the Box and was recently elected as IEPA's Vice President of Lived Experience Research. In her spare time, Shannon enjoys reading, baking, hiking, and spending time with her dog, Scout. And lastly, we have Matt Jackman, pronouns are they, them, received Australia's National Mental Health Advocate Award by the Mental Health Foundation of Australia in 2020. Matthew is the founder and principal consultant of the Australian Center for Lived Experience, an international peer-run consultant practice, um, an international peer-run consultant practice. They have been a global mental health activist promoting mental health, promoting human rights, social justice, and lived experience perspective from a public health and mad studies discipline. Matthew's advocacy career addresses alternatives to the biological, psychiatric, and psi science approaches to well-being with a focus on social, cultural, spiritual, and structural determinants. Matthew previously presented the Western Pacific region on the Global Mental Health Peer Network and was a global shaper with the World Economic Forum. They previously consulted the World Health Organization on lived experience, mental health perspective, and peer work practice. Matthew trained internationally in certified peer specialist practice. They have been a social work lecturer and researcher in mental health and trauma. Matthew has been a longstanding public servant in forensic mental health, Department of Social Services, and the National Disability Insurance Agency. They are a member of the Victorian Board of Management with the Australian Association of Social Workers. Matthew is an open service user, participant, consumer, and family carer of various systems. They are passionate about dismantling and reconstructing, reconstructing systems of justice-driven care. So we have a really awesome group, and I'm excited to kind of just dive in and and really, the first question I have for everyone um, is is just with whatever level that you feel comfortable, um, you know, sh share a little bit about yourself and what, you know, particularly maybe what about yourself that kind of brought you to this work, um, specifically kind of thinking about, um, you know, thinking about criti critical, you know, psychiatry, maybe thinking critically within the academy, what has led you to kind of, um coming to a place where you're you're essentially thinking at times you're at odds with the work that you do. Um, so, so however much you want to share about that, just share a little bit about how you came to this work, anything about yourself, um, and, and kind of what brought you to a more critical perspective of the work that you do. And um, I guess, uh, why don't we just start with Shannon? So um, I think I've had just a bit of an evolution <laughs> in my life and coming to terms with how I feel about these things. So um, I started hearing voices about 10 years ago um, and I grew up in a small town. So I think a lot of my kind of foundational experiences was just a lack of resources um, and kind of having a limited accessibility to any kind of uh, care for my mental health. So when I relocated to a city and I kind of found peer support, I feel like I really resonated with that um, as an experience. I got really into advocacy work. Um, I very much thought I wanted to be like more of a mental health advocate, more of a peer advocate. Um, I struggled with kind of maintaining uh, adequate pay in those spaces. I think that's a really common issue with these with this work. Um, I ended up getting really interested in more of kind of the systems thinking level uh, of uh, research that was what kind of drew me to it initially was just really being able to impact things in a way that it felt like um, activist work sometimes was was uh, limited in that lens for me. Um, and so, but I do kind of struggle for myself like separating activism and research. I do feel like those things are very intertwined for me. Um, and I'm grateful that I have been more or less able to intertwine uh, my lived experience and my research experience thus far. I hope that that continues to be uh, kind of my my uh, trajectory in this work. But that's, yeah, kind of a little bit of, of context into how I kind of got involved in this. Um, I definitely think that my background has informed a lot of my interest. Um, and now I... Um, yeah, just kind of seek to shed light on experiences that do kind of uh, intersect in that way. So yeah, thank you. That's more. Awesome. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, Juan, would you like to go next? Sure, happy to. Um, so um, I think similarly to, I think for me, it was like a lot of my own um, like lived experience as a queer person of color and coming from like Mexican immigrants has really shaped just 
um, my experience, experience and relationship to oppression, uh, particularly to systems. So that is just something that I uh, sort of was socialized into. Um, and I think part of that really shaped my own experiences as how I was interacting with the world and also how it impacted my well-being. And so it was interesting uh, for me. I think I struggled with a lot of just internal stuff like anxiety and depression around that and thinking that a lot of that was just me. And so it wasn't probably until like my undergrad going into grad school that I started to sort of like uh, develop more of a critical consciousness to these concerns and how rooted they were in these systems. And so for me, that gave me more freedom to just exist as me, but then also to like reinvent the systems. Like I love what you said, Rafika, about like working within and around, because I'm a believer that some dominant systems are created the way that they were created and they can be changed. And so you have to figure out how to work around and within. And so I, that's kind of my style too. Like I am not really interested in, in changing dominant systems. I'm more interested in trying to see other ways to liberate folks who are more marginalized and working within. So that's kind of where I generate a lot of my energy. Um, and I work particularly with students as a therapist and so a lot of my interventions go individually, but also trying to figure out um, in changing systems that more larger um, and less creating like band-aids to like solutions and more of like, how can we prevent these uh, roots? Um, so that's kind of like my sort of like uh, piece that I'm bringing into. So happy to be here, excited. Awesome, thank you Juan. Uh, Matt? Gosh, isn't it great to be amongst our own tribe? <laughs> <laughs> and we never we never get these spaces. Um, yes, similarly to Shannon and Juan, um, I've um, had my own living experience of intergenerational um, emotional distress and social and emotional well-being issues. I try to avoid any diagnostic medicalized terminology to explain my expressions of neurodiversity and trauma at a relational and institutional lens. Um, I lost my mother to emotional distress um, and was a young carer for a long time to my younger siblings and to my mum for a while. Um, and, and then, of course, through that period, had my own experiences um, of social and emotional distress. Um, not always distress. I also have gifts and superpowers and strengths and psychiatry defines that as bipolar disorder. Um, and complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and I'm on the warpath of attention deficit hyperactive disorder as well, which of course, you know, at the end of the day are all just really expressions of my upbringing and a lot of developmental trauma and oppression at various levels of being a gender diverse person, being a queer person, being more of a femme presenting person. Um, you know, there's so many lenses that I can look at it from. Um, and that really led me to um, studying social work and having an interest in um, power and how power operates at a relational and, and institutional level. Um, I was a pretty savvy kid growing up, so I had a very strong sense of injustice and anger and rage and confusion about what had happened to me, to my family and to my community. Um, and social work neatly packaged that um, in a critical way, um, you know, I won't kind of sing social work's praises because it's also can be very problematic as well. Um, and then I retrained as a peer um, and spent have spent a year of my life institutionalised um, at various points. Um, and, you know, and upon graduating, I worked in forensic mental health with lived and living experience consultants. Um, I say I have a living experience because I'm not dead and clinical recovery likes to say that, you know, we have to be well to, to do things. Um, so I'm um, living, still alive, um, and yeah, still, you know, very proud to be mad and be doing the work that I'm doing. But um, I've been an out mad academic, mad educator, uh, mad activist um, within various universities. But similarly, um, I've struggled to find tenured roles, paid roles. Um, often I've had to subversely use my social work training within social work to actually get those roles. 
and then say I won't be teaching from that perspective within mental health. And I currently do that at a university in Australia where we teach I teach critical mental health to social workers and we look at structural determinants, you know, politics, economics, material resources. We look at the, you know, we of course look at the social, but we focus on the structural and we look at all the alternatives to the DSM and the ICD. We look at peer models and we're, we're mad led and, and, and rather than centered you know we talk about person centered we're person led um and and there to align with people with lived and living experience so um it's a struggle um but i love the work that i do and i think you, you can absolutely be an activist within the academic space and challenge how knowledge is even constructed and given power from an epi, you know epistemological position i think we have a a strong role to play in challenging the injustice of how we privilege certain knowledge like medicine and biology over sociology and lived and living experience indigenous knowledge you know but i'm preaching to the converted so awesome thank you matt um yeah this is this is really great and i i kind of want to you know, pose the question a little bit of, uh, you know, kind of a definitional question. You know, the the title of this is, you know, kind of sets us up to think about how academia and uh, academics tend to, uh, I guess, lean towards pragmatism, or I don't know what the, there's like a force that is pushing towards pragmatism. I'm not exactly sure how to, de to describe it, but I kind of want to just ask you all, like, what does pragmatism mean in the academy? In the in the type of work you do, um, what does that what does that word mean? Or is there another word that you kind of uh, you know connect with that it explains maybe some of the um, potential like sacrifices or uh, not sacrifices, but almost things that you have to give up or trade up? Um, I know for myself, there's there's a long list of things that if I was not at the academy, I would be able to do. But the reason why I stay there is because, well, there are things that I can do while I'm at the academy that I couldn't do if I was there. So I guess my question is a little bit twofold, right? First of all, like, how would you define what pragmatism means in the context of like mental health work and the context of some, you know, political, social consciousness? What does pragmatism look like? Um, and, and how have you started to navigate that and some of the concessions that you maybe sometimes have to make um, staying in the academy, doing the type of work that you do? Um, so anyone, anyone can go first if they feel what to. Juan, would you like to go first? Sure. I was about, uh, to, I was about to click my buttons up. That's okay. Um, I think for me, like, I think pragmatism, I often view it as like, um, something that's like very practical, right? And that might be sort of like a, a like a given. But whenever I think of like practicality, I often find it at like very reductionistic. Um, and it's often like, um, like rooted in like very like white center, like uh, patriarchal. Um, and part of it too, like what it does, at least for me, what I find is that it limits the way that I express or even see or understand like phenomena in like a, a complex and nuanced way. And so that's something that I like find attention with like the pragmatist style. Uh, even thinking of like diagnostic, like a lot of the labels, right? It's very categorical and you either fit it or not. Uh, there's not a lot of fluidness. Um, and yet I still have to, like as a therapist, I still have to rely on some interventions that align to some of those uh, practical theories. Um, so in a way, like I, um, I try to balance a little bit of both. Um, I think for me, like I like to see it that I if I'm in, being imposed by this uh, pragmatic like style or definition or concept, I'll, for me, part of my style is like to deconstruct it and take pieces of what I find helpful, kind of like a collage and then rebuild it in a way that feels like more meaningful to me and the people mm -hmm. that I serve. And so that's like, for me, like the art of like what I can like re-envision. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's liberating. And it's also liberating for other folks. Uh, so that's how I engage with the pragmatism. Like I know innately, like I'm, I am like literally just nested in it. And I, unfortunately, I can't wake up the next day and just re-envision a whole new world, but that's the reality. But we can still play with it. And I think that's what I try to do is play with some of the pieces um, and make it as nuanced and sensitive as I can. Um, so. That's that's awesome. I love that answer, Juan, because I, 
I, you know, I'm, I did my undergraduate in neurobiology at UC Davis. I did my master's at, in public health at Boston University. And now I'm at UCLA. Like I am a pragmatic machine. Like I was like, mm -hmm. I'm being built to the last like 10 plus years to just like, that is like essential to, to it. And I love the way you said, because pragmatism is not inherently a bad thing. Like this is, this is a word that has a lot of very good uses, but the way that it's shifted and, and, you know, used in for, you know, for the purposes of things like expansion, colonialism, control, well, to be pragmatic about that is not good, but we can be pragmatic about our solutions or pragmatic about some of the visions we cast. Um, and I love the way that you use artistic and creative language because I do think it is a collage and it's creative. And um, anyways, that's that's beautiful. I love that. Uh, Matt, would you like to go next? Say something. Okay, sorry. My mind's exploding. Um, the gift of madness. Um, hmm. Yes, pragmatism for me is about action um, and doing. It's about doing. You know, we do a lot of thinking and ideating in the academy. Um, and for us mad folk, lived living experience, consumer, survivor, expatient, neurodiverse, disabled, however you identify, um, our work is located and always located in our community. You know, it's participatory, it's community focused, it's ground theory up. You know, it's not top down. It's about centering power. It's about equity. Um, and I think that we we do that by straddling the toxic toxic structures of higher education and university and research and modernist science, you know, what's defined as science and what's defined as an evidence base. Well, we are the bloody evidence base. Where do you think science comes from? You know, it's us. Um, we talk about it like it's this other nebulous concept, like even in biology, like we're studying humans. Um, so we, again, I think there's that problem of epistemic injustice in the, the knowledge production and what we value as knowledge in society, which is beyond mental health or well-being. Um, it's a it's a global industrial complex that needs dismantling, and we have a place in that. Um, so for me, yeah, being pragmatic is about you know. Um, actioning it's about being involved in community bringing community into community into the academy and bringing the academy into community so that we can challenge these systems institutions and structures that uh, represent psychiatric oppression but also as Juan's mentioned all the other intersecting oppressions that are often surrounded and centered by a psychiatric psych science focus yeah awesome thank you Shannon, would you like to go next to you? Yes, um, I, I'm i resonating with both of, of what you're saying. I definitely feel like for me, um, there is a lot of knowing when to act um, with pragmatism and like when to speak up about different things. I feel like that's something I definitely sometimes struggle to balance um, in kind of activism and um, academic spaces is like not always wanting to push back, but when you are kind of the only person with the experience in the room feeling need like you need to kind of speak up and kind of balancing uh those two sometimes conflicting values um but i definitely think that um you know there is a way to intersect those things and kind of finding finding the balance is definitely very important to me um and i had a thought that left my brain um but just along those lines, kind of, um, yeah, intersection of experience. Um, I definitely feel like utilizing lived experience more um, is very important to me. And kind of like you were saying, Matt, using kind of the experts um, in that in that frame. Um, I definitely struggle with that, and um, kind of jumping off of what you were saying as well, Juan, about terminology and language um, that's super near and dear to my heart and kind of these diagnostic criterion and labels I think um, can be really limiting and how we view I know definitely speaking to my own experience here with psychosis like there is so much of that experience that is not part of diagnostic criteria mm. um, that mm. I deeply resonate with and that I mm. have definitely experienced a lot of and so um, again like finding that time to kind of be open and honest about that and kind of speak speak my mind with it while also recognizing that like in America, 
we need those diagnostic labels and they do kind of inform access to insurance for better or for worse and things like that. So um, that's a lot of different thoughts, but definitely, yeah, where, where I'm coming from. Thanks. No, that's, that's really good. Um, you know, I think one of the things that I, I was thinking about is the, the academy is very slow. I mean, if you spend time, whether it's in grad school or you're doing a PhD or you're working there, I mean, everything is pretty slow, right? Like, I mean, to get a paper out, it takes a long time to get those ideas out. So something that I've like, it's, it seems even more apparent in, in kind of the psych realm, mental health, all those things that, you know, Matt kind of said it, I was like, where do you think you're getting, you know, these solutions from? And the more time I've spent studying public health, the more I realize that, like, I, I'm not sure if I'm exaggerating when I say like all of them, like all of the successful ones, like that. I don't think any of them have not come from the people experiencing that, that harm or oppression or violence. And so if that's the case and the academy is really set up again, this model of, you know, tapping into lived experience. It's something we go to for, again, it's an experience and we'll take that experience and transform it into like the singular policy or something like that. Um, you know, we have different forms of it in our research. We have community-based participatory research. We have all these different forms of trying to address some of those power issues. But I, I guess my question is, and I'm kind of leading up to it a little bit, but I'm kind of curious, like, how have you seen the academy make attempts at these and which of these attempts are genuine and real and which of them are kind of a way to um, serve a different purpose um, and and how have you kind of navigated um, some of those different you know experiences and ways that you might engage with the academy and its functions I don't know if that question makes sense but essentially I'm trying to ask like how how are you kind of seeing um, yeah I'll just I'll just stop there Can you repeat the question for me? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, sure. Um, you know, you're kind of saying like, essentially, you know, a lot of these solutions and a lot of the answers come from, you know, come from the people that have been harmed the most or have been controlled the most. And the academy is kind of always creating these versions of to try and, you know, we say like, oh, lived experience is something that we can tap into and use for a little bit um, for this policy. And then that's it. And so it doesn't really create some sort of structural change. And so, there's there's all these words and versions of it, whether it's community-based participatory research or even you know lived experience, and we we tend to disattach any political meaning from them. So I'm just curious, how have you seen that in your work? How have you seen kind of attempts to do some of the things that you're talking about here, but they sometimes fall short? Some of those like concessions that I was talking about. What are some of the concessions in making the change that you want to see that end up happening as a result of being within the academy? I'm happy to start. Is everyone on this panel aware of MAD, MAD studies? One, have you come across MAD studies? No? Okay. MAD studies for me is my discipline. It's what I'm training in. Um, we have the world's first Masters of MAD studies at Queen Margaret University in Scotland, and that has come from 30 years of activism in Canada around um, the history, the culture, the politics and the economics of mad people. Um, a key part of mad studies, so it's a critical disability study, it's a critical sociological discipline that centres mad knowledge, mad perspective. Um, it's not solely people with lived and living experience, um, but it centres our experiences, so it's transdisciplinary. Um, and for me, training in that has meant that I have a very strong, solid foundation from, a, you know, an ethical perspective, a theoretical perspective, a values-based perspective, a philosophical perspective in understanding our discipline because it's been wishy-washy because of also there's a lot of different perspectives in our movement too around different, you know, supports, how the world needs to change, you know, like any movement, there's diversity in perspective and view because we're human beings. And it has been a little derailed um, and silenced, I think, because of psychiatric oppression as well and, and how pervasive it is with other, other intersections of oppression. Um, but for me, MAD Studies brings to life um, the ability to be able to speak very clearly and articulately 
about issues of human rights violations, um, social justice and disability justice, um, and, yeah, alternatives to the DSM and ICD. We already have two that MAD people have centred, the power threat meaning framework. And um, what's the other one that just came out recently? The, um, the ITIM, the Indicative Trauma Impact Manual. So they're centred. These are centred ways of understanding human experience, suffering, distress, neurodiversity. Then on the flip side of that, treatment or intervention support, we have a whole raft of uh, interventions that are anti-oppressive. We're moving towards understanding, you know, um, stigma. We're moving away from that. Stigma is wishy-washy. doesn't mean anything. To sanism. We need to talk about emotional and mental ableism. You know, you're mad, you're crazy at a relational level. Institutionally, conflation of mental health and violence, discrimination in employment and education. By understanding sanism, then we can do anti-sanist practice and operationalise. The problem is we haven't operationalised mad theory enough. What does it mean, again, pragmatically in practice? And it looks like anti-sanist practice and we need to be having these conversations and we need to be training people within the psych science system as to the alternatives both in understanding and intervening. From our knowledge, they need to be led by us at the centre. My sermon is done. That's awesome. Thank you. I, I might, we might want to ask to, to get some, I might need to rewrite some of those down because I definitely want to check that out. But um, yeah, that that's awesome. Um, Juan, would you like to go next and share anything? Yeah. Sure. Um, uh, I appreciate the humor, Matt. <laughs> um, so I think like the way that I'm understanding your question, um, like when you were describing, you know, like your question, like one of like my statements or like mottos that I often like use within the academia or just like any system that is like dominant is like, I know that I'm in there, right? And they're in a way going to use me, right? Like they're going to politicize and tokenize what I offer as knowledge. And so often what I live by my motto is like, also I have to finesse the system too, right? So in a way, like I have to like speak their language. And so that's often what I do in a lot of the work. like. Uh, like as an example, like I primarily right now academically intertwine, I, I work as a therapist at a university counseling center. Um, and there's a lot of limitations in some of the services that we render as a therapist myself. Uh, but again, like me finessing the system, like we tend to be more short term model. However, like I have a short caseload where I go more long term, right. And I think I use clinical rationale and language to sort of like extend the treatment of the like the services that I provide. And in a way, like it's also people who truly need it. So for me, that's like how I work within like the system, right? Like using again, their language to make it seem like I'm doing and aligning to the values that they do. Um, Cause ultimately I know that I also am getting played <laughs> like within that system. Yeah. Just like I might as well also play y'all. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's brilliant. Because, you know, I think when I first started my PhD, that was not the approach I had for me, it was much more like every single issue I see, I am going in, and I'm going to let you know, like, I'm going to go in. And, you know, I, it's I think when you go into the academy, and you see some of this stuff, you're just like, what are you doing? Why are you taking this much money to do nothing? Like, and it can really can really like, you know, you distract you to say the least. And, and so I think that it's kind of a time and place thing. And the time and place is knowing which strategy to apply when. And one of the strategies in your toolkit is like, all right, I don't think I'm going to, I don't think I'm going to like really expose how I'm getting played in this current moment. And I want to do some like larger structural change one day, but in the meantime, let me game the system. And I just want to read a quote real quick. This is by a She's a, 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 a professor um, kind of doing more independent research. Now her name is uh, Dr. Robin uh, Magalit Rodriguez. And she says, uh, be the imposter. Um, she's kind of speaking to students and in, in, in academics. She said, be the imposter. Claim that role with pride. Be the renegade researcher whose mission, unbeknownst to the ivory tower gatekeepers, is to access knowledge for our community's power. Um, take the resources from the university and use those resources for that which they were never intended for. Invest in us, in our community, co-conspire for decolonial presence and futures. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it just, it kind of, it's, it's a lot of what you're just saying, right? It's like, how can I, you know, 
take from this place what is essentially rightfully my communities. And it's, you know, I think yelling at them might not get those resources out. And so that's like a better, that's a, it's a great material analysis of like, you know, trying to get out there, but then, all right, now I can do this other structural work. But anyway, sorry, I'm talking too much, but I love that. Um, Shannon, would you like to go next? Yeah, I love that as well. Um, I, I think one thing I'm personally consistently struck by is just kind of the institutional separation of lived and living experience and academia as as I've seen it like generally I've noticed a lot of like for example advisory councils kind of popping up like mushrooms everywhere um in the United States like I see it as as something that's that's very present and yet like when I've personally participated in those spaces or been a part of those spaces it's like you never see the clinicians you never see any of the people who are actually kind of conducting that work and so it just seems like there's such a uh, again, like a separation of those two things, even though I think they could very much inform each other and work together much better than they currently are and have been historically. Um, so I guess that's like both <laughs> answering how I see this coming up and also like a change I would like to see um, is just kind of those things genuinely working together much more than they already are. Um, because I think it's, it's very frustrating. It's like, for me, I definitely feel like it's one hat or the other. Like I'm either coming to that space with living, living experience, or I'm coming to that space, like wearing research coordinator hat. And it, I would love to be both. Like, I would love to be able to kind of have both of those things. And it feels like you're either pushing back or it, or they have to be separate in a way that I would, yeah, just, just love to see change. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I guess I have a question in terms of, you know, how you're thinking about um, in the places that you're at, and, you know, what sort of strategies or what, you know, what could you say to someone who is in, in this in-between space? Maybe they're an academic, maybe they're a researcher, maybe they're a little bit of both, maybe they're trying to be a little both, whatever it is. What, what would be some things you would want them to start to do, you know, thinking about where they're at? Like, what are some things, if they're new to this, that they should start to really explore and connect with? And, you know, let's say they've been doing research for a long time um, and they're realizing, like, I'm not connected to a movement. I'm not really part. I'm just kind of doing this solo act. So, you know, what are some things that you've done in your own journeys, um, if you've had a journey of this? Um, or, or, you know, what are some things that you could tell to someone that to help them start to like think, you know, maybe they've developed some of these critical consciousness, but how do they start to really take it to like an actionable step? Like, what am I doing? How am I shifting the way I'm doing my degrees? How am I shifting my partnerships? Or what is it that ends up looking different if you take, you know, this kind of, you know, renegade approach to being a scholar or whatever it is, but like, what is it that, you know, starts to make it look like actually different more than just the words and the things that we say, but like, how does that play out in your, you know, day to day? Um, you know, so I guess it's two part question, you know, what do you say? How do you kind of start to think about that? Start to do that? You know, where, where would people go? How do they, you know, prepare for that? And then also like, what are some, you know, what are some things that you, you start to see once you, once you start doing that, um, once you start doing that way, like what, when you started to think about your work, um, you know, as, as an academic and seeing some of the, you know, maybe the pitfalls, um, and then started to work differently with, with organizing or, or, you know, advocacy, how did that start to change maybe the work and, and what it looked like day to day? Shannon, would you like to go first? thinking over my response here, um, but I can take this as a space to, to speak in first drafts. <laughs> um, so I would just say, um, responding to individuals who are trying to get into this work or more for, for the systems themselves. Sorry, just to clarify. So oh, sorry, say that again? Yeah. Sorry, or, or should I answer as in like for people who are looking to get into this work or for the systems themselves? People yeah, for like people, into. yeah, people who can see into the work. Um, I think for me, just really reading about things that were of particular interest has led me down a number of rabbit holes <laughs> into really interesting projects that are happening um, and a surprising amount of like very niche interests just kind of exist um out out in the in the ether of the world that that one has access to um i would also just say um 
definitely big into more like community led grassroots type organizations. I think some of the most powerful work is consistently being done in those spaces. They're great places to connect with like-minded folks. Um, and I, I mean, I think we're in an age where there is so much kind of connection that is accessible to us um, in a way that's very powerful. And I would just say, utilizing that connection like really um I, I've definitely been surprised reaching out to people directly and having them be receptive so just not being afraid to kind of reach out and ask questions can be a really powerful way to kind of um get involved in different things so yeah th those are some thoughts yeah that's awesome I love that I love the kind of thinking of you know a starting point of really just being yeah look for the grassroots organizations in your community that are not you know, even not, you know, to be like not an NGO, even like one that is like truly like a group of organizers, you know, people, mad people who are trying to make shifts in these systems and just go up to the, you know, just ask, be like, I want to, I want to help. I want to join. Like, I don't, I think we've gotten to the point, I don't know what caused this, but I think we've gotten like a little like awkward at kind of like joining and asking these things. And it's like, yeah, there's probably ways to do it that are disrespectful, all that kind of stuff. But I think also there's a little bit of like, you kind of got to get out there and, you know, reach out, ask an, ask a nice email, introduce yourself and, you know, to an organization, right. And, you know, explain the situation and what you're trying to do and, you know, see what happens. Um, so I, I, I love that um, idea. Um, so, yeah, that's great. Um, Matt, would you like to go next? Yeah, I think just to build on whatever, you know, what's been said, um, at starting, you've got to start local, um, you've got to be connected to community. Um, because at the end of the day, this is representational work. Um, you're not just there to represent yourself, you're there to represent our community, the MAD community, the lived and living experience community, and all the other identifiers that people utilize in our community. And you will never cover the whole gamut of perspective, um, but you need to understand. You need to have an understanding, an awareness, a literacy, an education about the various perspectives that we do have. Um, and you only do that by being engaged with community, um, whether that's a reading group, you know, whether that is your local, you know, um, consumer peak body or, or peer service um, there's lots of different ways, you know, poetry, writing, Instagram accounts, TikToks, LinkedIn, um, you know, I mean, I'm guilty of sending off, you know, reams of emails at 2am with my euphoric mind at times. Um, so, you know, put yourself out there. Absolutely. Put yourself out there. Um, I didn't get to where I am now by being silent um, it's about being loud, being informed, and representing your community. That's awesome. That was Thank part you. one. What was part two? <laughs> um, yeah, like I think when when you start to you know engage in the work that way, you know how does it how does it kind of you know change? How does it change like materially for you? Like the you know the sort of connections that you make. Uh, the coalitions that you build. I mean, like, you know, yeah. Like how, how does that look like as, whether it's as a student or as a professor one day as an instructor, like what is, what does it actually mean to, to kind of place ourselves differently? Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think back to starting locally, um, I actually have been involved in more international activism than I have local activism because of the lateral violence in my community back home. Um, and I'm not sure whether this is something that you've all experienced, but when you're in an oppressed group and minority where tight power is very tightly held and protected for those that have it within your community, we can often experience harm by our community. Um, and often the door is uh, opened by some and then shut rather than opened and then left open for others to come after them. So we've had a number of even consumer academics in Australia, um, specifically in Melbourne, that are kind of known and notorious actually for being very protective over their titles that they've fought for. And, you know, reasonably so. They've had to fight very hard for those positions, but they also have a, a, a reputation for not leaving the door open for other people. And it makes it very hard for us to, you know, create a movement around um, academics in this space. 
Um, so I, yeah, very quickly moved to international work where I'm much well, much better known actually. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, and that, you know, that local stuff on the ground, you know, working in forensic mental health in peer spaces, peer systemic spaces, you know, led me to, you know, ongoing, being an ongoing consultant for the World Health Organization. I still am. As a result of that, I'll give you an example of the the labour that's involved. I've been a consultant and advisor on a voluntary basis for five years for the World Health Organization in various projects, essentially infiltrating and subverting mad knowledge to, you know, um, challenge the biomedical disease model of the WHO. And only now through um, their current, there's a current proje- uh, um, project or program um, that I've been heavily involved in as a subject matter expert um, called the WHO Framework for Meaningful Engagement of People with Living, Living, I'm, I'm going to take that credit, with Non-Communicable Diseases and Mental Health Conditions. So WHO are about to launch this next month. This has taken five years of advocacy work and infiltration of our knowledge. Um, and part of that is that WHO, part of that framework is that they need to be paying us. They need to be paying us for our expertise by experience, not just in sharing story, but in sharing our perspective and in sharing the various disciplines that we come with. We are experts from multiple spaces um, and we need to be acknowledged and awarded, you know, um, for our labour, you know, and the emotional cost of that as well as the knowledge translation. Um, So that's just a little example as to I'm starting locally and then, you know, dismantling at an international level to the point of actually creating institutional change within an institution like WHO to finally fund us to do the work that needs to be done. Yeah, I I really appreciate that perspective and that answer because I think I sure you're not the only one that like people have experienced that same sort of uh, violence or trauma or you know whatever to the extent at which it was and you know forces you and displaces you in some ways to to do the work elsewhere um and i think you know i i appreciate that again it's it's a little bit of like well this is this is how i do continue to do my work i mean you have a commitment to it and you're finding a place in which you can you know earlier in the other talk we were um, uh, uh, one of the panelists was talking about this idea of like finding cracks and and finding these places in our institutions or wherever it is where we can have some sort of agency and power. And so um, there's huge, you know, you know, uh, gaps needed to to address in, on an international scale, on a, on a national scale, on a statewide scale. Um, so I think I appreciate that that type of candor and honesty in terms of how you've navigated that. Um, yeah. Um, I want to do an answer next. Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, I mean, if anything, probably what I'm adding is only going to be connecting or tying to what both uh, Shannon and Matt have mentioned. I think uh, in thinking of like how to get involved, um, I think a lot for me personally is like, I think it's also the intention of how you get involved. And part of that is like also reflecting in your own like lived experience and in your own identities. Like I had a mentor once like, um, uh, that you would say like research is like me search, right? Because like in, inevitably you're doing research about yourself or some form of interest within you. And so I often see, use that as a compass with in my own social justice and trying to re-envision, right? Is a lot of the things that I do are interested or aligning to the pieces that I have. Uh, the other thing too, to the, I think Shannon, you mentioned about the community piece. I think that is like central right, to a lot of this work, uh, like, it, you shouldn't have to put all of it on your shoulders, right, it literally takes a community to uplift communities, and so don't put that onus on you, because that's also, you're just going to burn out fairly quickly, and then you're going to probably, like, be, like, traumatized or, like, feeling resentful about the system, and it also, like, we need as much power as we can get, and so, like, caring for yourself is, like, the thing. Uh, often, for me, too, what has been helpful is, like, sometimes it's like you don't need to reinvent the wheel like the history has shown us that the oppression and the injustice has been there for decades we don't need to like look past that like we can look at the ancestors like tools and see what they've worked and just maybe tweak them 
because uh, some of those injustices and oppressions, they're still plaguing us. Like they're the same things, they're just permutating. So we need to also be like strategic in that so that we can like also evolve in our own uh, like weapons with uh, social justice. Um, so that's kind of like how I see your question being asked. And I think I, I think I did answer it for both, so. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, no, and I, I, we have like about 10 minutes left and, you know, kind of want to give us enough time for this last question. And, um, you know, I think that there's, you know, not just that, that you said this idea of like not trying to do it all. And, you know, one thing I've like definitely had conversations with people who, who are activists here in Los Angeles is, you know, I mean, straight up, someone told me, like, we don't always want the academics to be activists. And I remember like listening to that. And I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. We talked about it a little bit more. And it was just kind of like, and I'd seen it in my my own work that there were certain things and ways that I was trying to be an activist, right? Let's, for the sake of this conversation, make reductionist uh, identities here, but, you know, trying to do more activist style things or whatever it was. And, and it kind of was like, is that what was needed? Is that what was asked for? Or was that just something I was kind of doing because I was energized in the moment? And so I had to ask myself in the current place I'm in, in this current time with the resources and the people that are around me and what my task is, um, what is required of me? And so my question to you in kind of bringing that up is, you know, I've, I've talked with a ton of students, uh, younger students who are ranging from, you know, youngest, usually like 17. So they're in like high school, about to go to undergrad, but most of the time they're undergraduate students and they're interested in some sort of health field, whether it's public health, medicine, psychology, social work. Um, and they, you know, the, the type of cautiousness that students have these days is is way greater than what I had when I was in undergrad or applying to grad school. And not just cautiousness. I mean, it's their whole analysis of like the academy and, you know, what it's done and what it is doing. And I, as someone who's very critical of the academy, tend to be, you know, outspoken about it. And I've like realized at some point, I wondered, does me community, like me constantly talking about how terrible it is and all that, does that like eventually just push people away? Like push those really cool students who I kind of want to be, you know, organizing with, does it push them away? I don't know if that's true, but I guess my question for you is, you know, how, what, what is it that you would say, or how do you start to talk to, you know, students who are listening or thinking about, grad school, thinking about the academy, thinking about who are activists and want to organize and work with academics, knowing just how fractured, broken it is, all those histories. What do you what do you say to them? I mean, I, I think I've had students who just said, like, I've seen how bad it is. And I think, like, maybe it's a waste. I don't think it's worth it. Um, and so I'm just I'm just curious. You've kind of said versions of this throughout. But just like if you can kind of bring it all together, like, I mean, why are you still like essentially why are you still there? Why are you still kind of making it work? How are you you know making it work? And, you know, my answer is a little bit like, please come. We need more. We need more dope people to continue making these changes. It's just that simple. Like, I, yeah, it is awful. I can talk about that every day. But, um, it, you know, to me, it's contested space. Like the academy, these institutions are very much contested space. And, um, you know, to contest it, we need, we need more, you know, people occupying those spaces in some shape or form. So I guess my question to you is, you know, for those who have um, a, a certain level of doubt or uh, angst or frustration that's real, that's like legitimate, it's not made up, but, you know, what do you do with that? Um, and, you know, what do you, what would you say to them? And uh, yeah, when, uh, Shannon, why don't you go first? I will just start by, um, I've had as a participant, some of the most awful experiences with research, um, like participating in research. And I think, I, I mean, I agree. I think one of the easiest ways to change that is just to actually make the change that you want to see in those spaces. One of the, some of the most empowering experiences I've had in academia have been kind of being able to shift things that uh, I previously really struggled with. I think the biggest one that I encounter is just um, zero contact with researchers after you've kind of given a lot of yourself and your time and your energy and um, never hearing back about the project and kind of where things have, have come and being able to really report back to people and involve them along the process has been incredible. Um, and I feel like being able to, yeah, just, just create those shifts um, is, is very empowering. Um, and I agree with you, Rafiq, just kind of, there needs to be so many more people uh, who are directly impacted by what is being looked at. And 
even though it can be frustrating, like those moments in which you can really see things shift and you can see the impact that you've been having um, are so incredible. Like the, the moments I've had have just been so um, beautiful. And I think like that to me has made it worth it. Like just those moments of having uh, like being able to sit back and being like, wow, I did that. Like that was me. Or, you know, those moments of, of really, truly seeing uh, tangible changes that you yourself have created. So that has definitely, um, I would say, just kept me going and also being able to, um, like I said, like actually shift things that you know are super problematic that currently do exist in, in academia as very regular practices. Um, so yeah, I appreciate that question. That's a good one. Awesome. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, Matt, would you like to go next? Yeah, I, I think again, to, to speak back to um, epistemology and how knowledge is constructed in society and the power that's attributed to certain knowledge, we, we need to be contributing to that, um, to be deconstructing that. You know, we need to say, there's lots of other ways that we can value equitably knowledge, you know, whether through writing, through song, through artwork. Um, this is mad knowledge and in any other knowledge space, you know, there's lots of ways to understand um, human phenomena, you know, but we've, we've, we've grown into this capitalist, neoliberalist, modernist, individualistic way um, of, of understanding, you know, human experience and, and trying to, I call it complexification, you know, where we, um, and I'm going to have to trade that trademark that now, um, but it's where we, we try to make complexity simple. We give something a label, you know, oh, bipolar, you know, that explains manic depression, right? Um, but then when we simplify complexity, we actually make it more complex because we're only looking at it from one slither, from one slice of the pizza. We're not looking at it holistically, intersectionally, you know. So we have this problem as human beings as well, and we see it in government in terms of funding. There's no forethought ever given to funding long-term, you know, um, policy. It's often very crisis-driven. It's what, what can we see ahead of us? And then we repeat the same cycles often. You know, we take one step forward or two steps forward, one step back. So I think by us being present and pa having power in numbers within the academy, because um, I'm a very firm believer that we bring activism to our work. I see it in my classroom space where we're all co-learners, by the way. I'm not the educator. I'm not the teacher. I, 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 I teach from a co-learning, co-design, co-production perspective where all of our experiences are co-constructing knowledge in that space because we are. It's science that's coming out of that space. It's activism. So, you know, through those conversations where you provide a little bit of subject matter expertise, of course, some literacy building, you know, oh, mad pride. You know, I see, you know, a co-learner say, oh, I've spoken to my sister who was recently diagnosed with bipolar and she had no idea about mad pride. And now she can understand from a different lens, a different framework, a different perspective that's a lot more non-pathologizing. You know, like I, so I see it, you know, I see it when we have conversations, that's where it all starts at the end of the day, conversation, consciousness, raising subversion, you know, that we need to, we need to be engaging in dialogue um, at a relational and at a community level, you know, and we do that as mad academics or lived and live, living experience academics. That's beautiful. Thank you, Matt. Um, Juan, would you go last? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I was like really resonating with your question of like, you know, what keeps like us uh, in like the academy. And I think honestly, I'm probably going to sound like I'm like, <laughs> like just like this devious person. But honestly, like part of the reason I still stay in academic spaces is because like there's still a lot of power there. Right. And in a way, I'm also like stealing some power too. Right. Just like transforming it in a different way. And I think I use a lot of the resources that are afforded to me within that space, but taking it away and reconstructing them in ways that feel more tangible to the community, right? So it almost feels like kind of like uh, Robin Wood, I, I think is at like the, yes. like kind of like that. Um, um, and, you know, the other piece too that I was resonating with what you mentioned, Rafik, about, you know, like there is this energy and the successfulness with like, pre like these incoming generations. I so much agree. 
And I think a lot of it too is like perhaps like like for me, I see sort of my role that maybe I am willing to take a little bit more of like the beating for it and the system so that I can make the next cohort of folks or generations more easier to exist in. And so that's often what I convey back to the mm-hmm. folks that I interact with. Because mm-hmm. um, for me, it has been easier with my mentors out there. Like they have probably have had worse than myself. And so for me, like gives me some hope that I am just like building on. And again, like where it's community driven, even through that process is also very community driven. Um, mm-hmm. And it's also just very generational to feel like talk about the power that we can just like good power, right. That we can flow mm-hmm. to the next generation and create mm-hmm. beautiful momentum. So that's how I like try to leave like planting seeds so that someone else can just like grow them. <laughs> and hopefully yeah. they the first doesn't burn. <laughs> No, that's, that's so awesome. I love that. Cause I think, you know, I've, I've, even as a grad student, I, I want to be a professor one day, hopefully, but as a grad student, I'm just kind of like this research I'm doing, these things I'm writing, I don't know how important they are. I don't know how many people are even reading it, but the classes I've taught and the connections I've had with students and like being able to shape a classroom so that it is like this more and more often, like that is so powerful. And, you know, so really thinking about it as a project of, you know, not just for our lifetime, but for, you know, for future lifetimes is, you know, really important. And, you know, someone was asking in in the, in the chat, they said, um, uh, Brinky 75 said, once you infiltrate, how do you protect yourself from becoming part of the system that has a very different agenda? Um, and, and Sarah was kind of talking about in medicine, there's a similar thing as being like a psych resident. And, you know, I, I don't have like an easy question for that because I think we we all are, you know, infallible people. But um, I, I think the answer is what a lot of us have been saying is like community and movement and being really root, rooted and attached to the people. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's mm-hmm. what the academy is good at is like you'll come in, they'll bring they'll bring you in as this brilliant researcher and you're a community scholar and they will keep pulling you away and constantly pull you away. And that's mm-hmm. when you no longer have the protection of like the community activists. And, you know, right now I'm, I feel very close to a lot of the, the community organizers in L.A., And I feel like they have like, there's like a protection over me in some ways. Like if I start to get into some shit with, with my school, I don't know. I got a whole bunch of like dope community-based organizations in LA who they themselves have power. And so I think, you know, how do you really protect yourself? It's, it's not just finding like a, you know, your own lab that you build, but really rooting and digging yourself with, you know, co-conspirators, you know, someone mentioned mentors and, you know, but again, like having, being a part of an organization, like everyone should be able to say like, yeah, I'm part of this community organization and that's who I do my research with. And, you know, I'm connected with and whether it's international or global, but like something that really places you with other people and not just as a solo person in the academy, I think um, that's like one place to start, but uh, you know, we're, we're a little bit over time. So I'm going to, going to close it off, but um yeah, staying grounded with yourself and roots within community. Yeah, that's right, Branky. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone so much. This was uh, such a special time. I really, really appreciate it. I feel so rejuvenated. Um, and I'm just excited to kind of re-listen to it. But um, yeah, just thank you everyone for listening. And sorry if I didn't get to all your questions, but um, I hope this was a, a generative time for you all. But uh, I'm going to pass it back to Joseph right now. <laughs>